Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the next installment of this faux live stream. And I have with me here the bit of wool that I probably wanted this one to be, but it just wasn't going to turn out that way because I blended it so much. Um, but you can kind of see here, uh, this is really what I was aiming for. And Layla has been asleep this entire time. <laughs> I start filming for 30 seconds and she's awake now. <laughs> and the last episode... <laughs> hey everyone, welcome to the next installment of the faux live stream where I take something that I wasn't really too enthusiastic about and make it something better. Uh, as usual, I got 30 seconds into the first take and Layla, who had been sleeping all afternoon, decided to wake up and destroy my setup with her incessant need to be around me. <laughs> so uh, I've had to banish her, unfortunately. But um, essentially, what happened with this wool? I finished spinning it. And I needed the bobbin because I was working on another project and I needed that bobbin so I can ply. Uh, I should probably just get some more bobbins, but hey, <laughs> make it do with what we've got. So I had to turn this one into a center pull ball, which is really simple. I just use a ball winder. Um, and I'm going to ply from the outside, which is technically the start of the wool. And I'm going to be plying it with the end of the wool here. But again, it's not going to matter. If you've ever done a center pull ball two ply, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, this is sort of the kind of texture I was going for, both visually, you know, in terms of color, but then also in terms of keeping those, um, like the character of the wool and the silk that I used. So if I can get this camera to focus on the wool and not my face. <laughs> so yeah, you can kind of see what I was going for. There's a lot more visibly going on in this yarn than in this yarn. So even though I got a lot of really lovely comments from people saying that this reminded them of a silk purse, that it was beautiful, the answer is it is. <laughs> And uh, in this case, it's sort of the eye of the beholder. I don't think it's a terrible yarn, but seeing what it transformed into, it basically went from this, which is what I wanted, into this. So for me, as a creator, I was a little bit disappointed with how that turned out. Now, there are loads of ways that I could have taken this yarn, or this wool, and sort of split it up into uh, bits, carded it with some other wool, and then used this bat as a blending component for other bats, um, which I have done before. And I think I mentioned that actually during the last live stream that, you know, if I was doing this for me, I would have said, I don't like that. I'm gonna <laughs> sort of like recycle this bat into a new bat, which is one of the wonderful transformative aspects of fiber arts. However, I also remember the early days when I was making drum carded bats. So essentially I had to borrow one from our guild and I had to pay $10 a month for it. So I didn't always have access to it. And because I worked full-time and I taught martial arts in my spare time, I didn't have a lot of extra time to just, you know, do that exact thing. And sometimes I knew I was going to have, I was going to meet up with the other spinners in my local guild. Um, I think we had it like Friday afternoons or something like that. I would take a lunch break from work. So it was more complicated for me to go there. <laughs> So, um, you know, you might end up being at the wheel and thinking, oh, well, in this lighting, I don't, I don't really like the way that it looks. Or you look around you and you kind of get that wool envy and you think, oh man, it doesn't look as cool as what they've got. 
And for me personally, developing this artistic side of me, I wanted to achieve that. And the only way that I could really go about this, especially back then, was through experimentation. So this isn't bad by any means. And I'm not saying it's bad. It's just not what I was going for. And if you're in a situation where you've gotten to the stage where you've just kind of gone through and spun it, just to kind of see how it turns out, because, you know, the spinning process can change things. And if you're still not in love with it, there's other things you can do. You can apply it on yourself, you can use it for different projects. Or in this case, I blended up a bat that I loved, <laughs> spun it a little bit thicker. I did think initially I was going to go a little bit thinner, but also just given how thin this was, I thought it might look more uh, visibly um, full of texture if I did sort of a thicker single with a thinner single without having to do anything really fancy because the texture in the bat would give me sort of like the thick and thin aspect. So I just kind of spun it as it came. Uh, if there was a lumpy bit, I tried to make sure it wasn't dramatically lumpy because I don't want the yarn to fall apart. But I also wanted to make sure it didn't get too thin. So uh, what we're going to end up making is an unbalanced two ply yarn. So I've got this and I'm just going to use this bowl that I've got on the floor here. And this is going to sit in there and I'm going to apply from it. Now I've had to switch corners from where, where I have been filming to where I'm currently filming because I'm trying to get rid of this, it's like a sleeper couch and it doesn't fit in our apartment the way that it did in our last place. And one thing that I find really frustrating is having furniture that doesn't make any sense for your life, it creates problems. And so we don't really need it, so I'm just gonna get rid of it. So that is taking up space. So if I need to take more photos of it for um, online, then it's already cleaned up and looks nice. I'm also using it at the moment for all of my photography, so <laughs> there's that too. <coughs> Excuse me. So, if you've um, never done a yarn like this, it's basically just as if you are spinning a, two, a normal two ply. Um, the only difference is you have to be mindful of the amount of tension you're applying for each of the plies. But we, but the <laughs> by what I mean by that is. Uh, if you have a thicker yarn and a thinner yarn, you've probably added more twist to one than the other. The thinner yarn usually has more twist uh, in order to hold it together as a sturdy yarn than uh, the thicker yarn. So that actually may come into play during the plying process. And if you vary the amount of tension or even the angle in which you're holding... I think we went out of focus for a second there. Yeah? Yeah? We're out of focus? No, we're in focus. I think it's okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, if you, for example, hold the yarns kind of like a V out, uh, you're more than likely going to maintain even amount of tension. Uh, if you know what a beehive yarn is, um, one of the things that I've done with uh, beehive yarns, which I've not made them in a very long time, but I keep one of the plies in one hand so it's coming straight out from the orifice. And then I have uh, the other yarn that I know is going to be doing like the coils. I sort of feed it on more lightly. That means when I push the beehive uh, into shape, it, it forms a little easier. <laughs> so if you know what I'm talking about there, then maybe you, you'll have a sense of uh, what we're going to be doing. Now, um, I did break my foot. <laughs> so it's not a major break, but I do have this lovely brace, which um, this is this is out of laziness, where I've got it just <laughs> three out of the, the five little Velcro patches. 
Um, but the wonderful thing about using a double treadle wheel is um, I can actually lay my foot out of the brace on the, the treadle and it just rests there. I actually don't use it at all. When I first started spinning, I actually had my foot in the brace just in case, but I actually don't need to today. So I'll take that off. This is also a comfort thing. I find it more comfortable to just have my foot sitting on there, but my left foot is the one doing all of the hard work. So you can see here, it is a lot thicker than the uh, other yarn that I showed you. Oh, that is a fiber. I thought it was a piece of my hair. <laughs> so I use the watercolor blending effect. Basically, I wanted to have the same colors that I used in, I gotta turn this lighting down just a touch. There we go. So I used the same colors and fibers in both of these, but the, the variance really is uh, obvious when you consider how I blended it all together. So the thinner yarn I blended four times and following a different principle than the other one. So I'm just going to tie those in a simple overhand knot onto my leader and then begin the plying process. So I should really clean off my leader because what happens is when I do the overhand knot and then I skein off the result. There's usually a little bit of wool, like a bit of uh, spun yarn still stuck on there. <laughs> and um, it gets to be a bit of a block whenever I'm spinning. So I'm trying to keep them with even tension and I'm literally just plying it as if it's um, like being plied on itself, like they're identical. But you can kind of see that it isn't quite perfectly balanced. And so the result is I get a little bit of this texture. And uh, parts of the spinning process, um, you'll probably be able to see this more in areas where one of the, well, the, the the second bobbin that I made, the texture is going to be a little bit more obvious. So you can see that there where it's almost like the thinner single is kind of wrapping itself around that slubby bit right here. So it's a two ply and you could use it as a, as a normal two ply. But it's not balanced in that the two yarns in the two ply that I've made aren't the same gauge. So if you are, um, you know, experimenting with different plying methods, uh, incorporating something like this can actually give you a lot of visible texture. So sometimes when I have had uh, one of those four ounce braids of wool, I will spin some of it in a slightly different way so that I can use it in a project um, where I want a little bit more texture or visual interest. So it's an easy way to do almost nothing to create a lot of visible interest. Um, and you don't even need a drum carter in that case. It's just the, the mixing and matching of spinning methods. So um, as I was saying before with the two plies, they're both going in together at the same uh, tension. I'm just holding them with my right hand rather than my left. And um, in doing so, I'm just making sure that one yarn isn't sort of wrapping around the other more so. 
Maybe this makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, please let me know. Unfortunately, I have to do these live streams for a little longer because uh, very frustratingly, they sent the wrong team uh, to do the internet install. So instead of getting one sent out the next day or in a couple of days, I now have to wait until mid-December, which <laughs> is unheard of. Especially since it had nothing to do with me. I sat at home all day because it's not like I was going to go anywhere with a broken foot. But um, I have another five and a half weeks or so to wait. Um, and then hopefully everything goes according to plan. Um, but like I said, if you've got any questions about what I mean about the evenness of tension when it comes to the ply, just put that into the comments below. So that's pretty much it. Um, because I am using wool that's very similar to the initial bat that I didn't like, together they are going to have visual harmony. So they're, they're not going to be so distinctly different like um, uh, barber pole yarns can sometimes be. So you can see again here in this little sample, right? It's sort of like I designed it this way all along, but um, I didn't and I was just following that principle of, well, spin it up and see how it looks and if you don't like it, you know, sort of regroup and decide something else with it. You know, you never know uh, what you're going to like <laughs> until you just do that. So um, I take this philosophy to heart with everything. So um, I am not a huge fan of post-apocalyptic type stories, but my partner bought and installed Wasteland 3 on my computer. And even though the story and the aesthetic isn't the type of video game I like to play, the fact that he wants to play that story, you just kind of, you know what, let's see if I like it. And actually, because it's very similar to D&D turn-based, um, like pen and paper type games, it's kind of fun. And I've played games like that, uh, most recently in Baldur's Gate 3, um, which is another video game. And it's, it's fun for me to kind of compare and contrast the way that different video game developers tackle the, um, the turn-based uh, strategy uh, of D&D. So yeah. Um, that's kind of what I'm trying to encourage you guys to do is think more broadly about what it is that you're doing and growing up being told you're doing things wrong, that's not the way that it's done or how it's supposed to be or you can't do it this way or that way, you know, just <laughs> full feet in, you've seen someone do it and I'm totally fine. <laughs> Maybe a little bit crazy wacky, but that's why I'm unique. <laughs> uh, but I think you should just go ahead and do it and enjoy it. And even at the very end, if you hate it, there's still lots of ways to reuse that yarn. As I said in the last faux live stream, if at the very end you still hate the yarn, you can always repurpose it for something that maybe no one's ever going to see. You know, I. Oh my gosh, I remember how long it took me, but I had all of this castle milk more it because I bought a fleece and I intended <laughs> to spin it for a sweater. So I was gonna make some sweater quantities of yarn for it um, out of out of the castle milk more it. And in the end, I just wasn't happy spinning it. And I didn't think I would be happy wearing it either. So I just kind of threw it into the stash and thought, well, I guess I'll do something with it later, you know? Um, and then my cat Layla, because she has a tendency to suckle things, 
which I suspect has something to do with her um, possibly early weaning phase. Uh, she would put sweaters and wool and, and other types of things into her mouth to suckle, and so I thought, well, if I made something for her, specifically for her, then I don't care, and she's not going to ruin anything, and because it's such a robust wool, it doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> so I wanted to show you this bit here, because uh, the bit that I'm spinning the collars are very, very similar in the plies, and that is because of that principle I was explaining about, like, uh, with watercolor. So if you uh, are working on a composition, one of the things that watercolorists will do is they will work with, let's say, six colors, and use those six colors to create an entire composition of lights and darks and contrasts without having to necessarily use a prepared brown or prepared green in order to achieve that. And in doing so, the colors in that composition harmonize. And so by paying attention to what I use, I could create a second bat that would look good plied with the yarn that I didn't like. <laughs> so um, I think that's a really useful tip if you don't know like how to save a, a project like this. Definitely um, look to the fine arts world uh, for a little bit of color theory inspiration. Um, and if you're still not sure, uh, you can always do like a little sample once you've got a clear image of wh like where you want to take this as a direction. But even if you don't, if you've just got little bits of wool, um, if, if you even have a little bit of the wool that you had um, in the first bat that you hated, or maybe didn't like very much, hate is a bit of a strong word, <laughs> but disliked, uh, then if you use that as a component of the uh, plying yarn, like I've done here, then um, it's just gonna go. Even if you don't have any left over, you can still use colors from the same color family. So even if I didn't have any of this wool just in my uh, inventory, I could have just thought, well, I've got this stuff in merino. Right, I've got it in yellows and oranges and whatever. So I could still make something that would harmonize with the overblended bat that I didn't really like the result of, and it would still it would still go. Um, but I think to for those who kind of fit into the category of I'm not really artistic and uh, you don't have a lot of experience working with something like this, then um, I think still my advice is see how it turns out. I, I've never truly been disappointed with uh, what I've made, but I have sort of... <sighs> is disappointed the right word? I guess it is. I don't, I don't want to be uh, disheartened with my disappointment. I just want to find ways that can help me make it better without having to have, you know, years of experience and all this intuition, which comes through just using it. Um, and, uh, you know, a, t a tips and tricks bag is nice. So in terms of other updates, um, I probably should take down my Halloween stuff because Halloween is now gone, and I like to keep up the more autumnal stuff at least until Thanksgiving when I will take everything down and put up all my Christmas decorations, which is always fun. And this is the first time I have needed to design where I'm going to put all my Christmas decorations. So, 
yeah, that'll be kind of interesting. Um, there aren't that many ledges here, and I still don't have a lot of furniture. Pretty much, this is a boarded up fireplace that's original to the building. Um, so that's it. My, my incense burner lives there. And it's a permanent 24-7, 365 decoration in our house. But um, these, these window ledges is literally the only other place where I can put decorations. And if you have a cat like mine, she has to chew on everything and play with everything. I've had to hide... Um, I've got these little gourds. I've had to hide them from her because she always gets them down and bats them around and destroys the display at the same time. <laughs> She's like a destructo cat in an eight pound form. <laughs> Which I'm sure everyone who's a cat owner can relate to. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I've got some thoughts about what to do for the holidays coming up. I have started to do some bats, which I can show you here in a second, some of the ones that um, I've not even taken photos of. I do have some already in the shop, and actually probably by the time this video goes live, uh, the bats I'm about to show you will probably already be in the shop, but um, as a creator, um, a product creator, it's sort of difficult dealing with Christmas. I think for me, Autumn is a lot easier a theme to coordinate with my bats, but Christmas is always a little bit difficult, and I'll tell you why. When I was growing up, I experienced a lot of bullying, and I just got into a habit of not wearing certain things, because whenever I did, I would be bullied for making that faux pas, right? So, one of them was coordinating red and green during Christmas, and also black and orange, and green and brown, because every, especially on the top, if I ever wore a green sweater with brown jeans, kill me, because <laughs> um, I would, like, people would always comment that, oh, you dress like a tree today because you have no style. <laughs> I don't even know why it's an insult, but, you know, kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, red and green is so iconic of Christmas that it's a little bit like painting yourself into a corner. And what I mean by that is if you don't sell those items during Christmas, you have to put them into storage until next Christmas because more often than not, if they don't sell, they're really, really unlikely to sell throughout the year. Um, so I've, I've made Christmassy bats in the past, and they never do as well as my sort of Halloween bats or my autumnal bats. But this year, I'm just going to go ahead and make some because I've got a ton of green that I, I keep using really sparingly in my other bats, but uh, I need to make some space so that I can dye some more wool, um, and so I'm just going to roll with it. Uh, if you like the red and green combination outside of Christmas, please let me know because as a creator, it would be nice to know what people uh, use those projects for. And I know there are some of you out there who do craft, um, you know, for Christmas during the summer. So if that's you, please let me know. Or if you have non-Christmassy types of crafts, I would be thrilled to know what you make with them. Uh, I'm at that point now where I need to make some decisions about uh, how much of this to put onto this bobbin. Now, I didn't weigh anything before I started because even though I do this for most of my projects and for the stuff that I do that has a plan, I don't always do that when I'm just sitting down at the wheel to spin something like I am now. I sort of see how much I've got, and then I say, okay, well, that's how much I've got. 
but I'm guessing that this is probably at least 100 grams for the two different yarns here. But because the second ply, the, the one that I did after um, uh, I did the blend, over blended mat, it's a lot thicker. And with a thicker yarn that is plied, it has a tendency to bloom, even though it's not even been washed yet. And actually, it's, it's got a lot more of the red, pink, and goldish tones, which you can see here, hopefully. I've had to keep this light a little brighter just so that it can um, counterbalance the window so that I'm not backlit. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I'll obviously take some better photos of this and maybe even splice it into uh, the video, even though I'm trying to keep these from being too edited, um, otherwise it kind of defeats the purpose of what this is a spiritual um, resemblance of. So, um, because it's blooming more, I don't have a lot of free space on my bobbin at the moment. So I'm not sure if I'll be able to get the whole bit of the yarn on here. And if it doesn't look it, that's okay. But it might, it might just fit. <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, the other thing I wanted to um, point out is whenever you have injuries, you really have to be mindful about the way that your body works and if anything hurts to just stop doing it. Um, sort of assess, okay, well this hurts here because of this. And I understand being a crafter, you still want to carry on. There are oftentimes ways to adapt what you're doing to um, accommodate whatever injury or even if it's just like, oh, I think I slept wrong and my shoulder hurts when I spin, so what if I do something like this? You know, could be temporary, you know, just for that day or two. So I still have tendonitis in my left hand, and one of the things that I want to talk about in a future video is twists. How do I manage twists with my yarns? If you've watched my previous videos, I have a tendency to do a backwards draw, which um, for some people I've heard and I was told when I first started that that's the, a bad way <laughs> to do it, but I didn't have really much in the way of direction when I first started, so when you're self-taught, you kind of just go with whatever works. But it's actually not a bad way to spin yarn, um, but having tendonitis has actually revealed things about the way I insert twists with the way that I spin that has made it actually pretty effortless to spin this way. So I don't actually hurt myself while I am uh, spinning uh, as opposed to flying. Flying is usually a lot easier. Um, but it's sort of that, that pinching that you do. So like when you do a forward draw, you're sort of pushing the wool into the orifice as you're spinning. No twist enters your fiber at all and you end up producing a very smooth, consistent yarn. However, because I do sort of like a backward supported long draw style, it doesn't, um, I don't actually keep all of the twist out of my fiber. And as a result, um, I can spin with tendonitis and I don't have any issues. But I guarantee you, the moment that I switch to doing a short forward draw where I have to do more of that pinching, it's basically this motion where I've got my fingers like pushed together, but really it's with my thumb on top rather than on the bottom, that hurts so much. So when I uh, realized that I had this injury, it was literally because I was doing this to cups of coffee 
that sit on a saucer. Like that, that motion was causing a lot of pain and there was a lot of tension in the tendon and the, the joint itself was really swollen. So doing that same motion in order to draft for, like a short forward draw, there's just no way I would have been able to spin at all, including right now, despite the fact that it's been a couple of weeks and um, I do therapy with this hand every single day. Um, but I haven't had any issues where I've caused it to lock up, which is a terrifying feeling <laughs> if that has never happened to you. It, you bait like, <laughs> the first time it happened, it was sort of this weird morbid curiosity because it's, it, it, it didn't feel real. It hurt, <laughs> obviously, and I knew I needed to do something about it. But if you've ever watched a, a movie where, you know, some hunky action hero guy the the main the main hunk of the movie he gets like his shoulder knocked out of place and then they're like oh just knock it into place by using this door jam or whatever <laughs> um it was it was kind of like that where it's like huh my thumb is not moving <laughs> So I, I couldn't actually move it. it. It was such a weird feeling, like I, I could feel the pain, but I couldn't move it to get it to uh, relax. So I had to use my other hand to like adjust it back into place. <laughs> it was really bizarre. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of glad for the weird way that I learned or taught myself how to spin because I don't know if I would actually have been able to do this um, as I have been. So I'm nearing the end here, which is pretty amazing. I think normally during a live stream, I'm not able to produce uh, a full bobbin quite like this, because I'm usually stopping and reading the chat and catching up, which I hope to be doing uh, in December. But I will uh, pretty much be done with this, so we can actually see the final result. If you have any other topics for the future that you want me to cover, please post those into the comments below. And it doesn't have to be a tutorial. Um, I just covered this topic because it was a request from one of you and um, it felt like I was reconnecting with part of my past because I had experienced this exact phenomenon so I was like, I got this. <laughs> so um, I'm very happy to cover it in sort of like a tips, tutorials, things to think about um, capacity. Um, but if it's something that I've never done before, like the flax spinning that I did, I had no idea what I was doing. It was really the first time that I ever tried to do something like that. And I got a lot of encouragement. Um, I still have the yarn. I don't know what to do with it because I don't think I have enough yardage uh, to weave anything. So that means I'll probably have to make more. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm happy to do a video uh, for the faux live streams, or even during the normal live streams uh, going forward, where, um, you know, I'm just kind of doing something for the very first time. Uh-oh. I think it fell off the end. <laughs> it did. <laughs> oh, man. And this is how much I've got left. <laughs> of course. <laughs> So let's see if I can fix this really quick because what's happened, move the camera here. I don't know if this is picking it up, but basically the yarn has just slipped off the back side of the bobbin down into this little groove here on um, my bobbin. Yeah, you can kind of see where it's fallen off. So I'm just going to try to rescue it really quickly. <laughs> um, yes, this has happened before. I get a little bit greedy and think, oh, I'll just spend a, a, a touch more, a little bit more, it'll be fine. And then this happens. <laughs> oh, God. 
I normally use my left hand um, for a lot of things and I can't now because it hurts. <laughs> That's one of them. <laughs> so, once I take this off, I'll just kind of re-thread it on and put it on that hook. And um, it's fine to be a little bit lazy because even if there is a proper way to do everything, it's fine to uh, do what I'm about to show you because the result is you're still making yarn. Okay, so when I first started spinning with my babe, I would run into this problem where the fatness of my um, bobbin, because it was full of yarn, it would sort of impede the uptake of the yarn onto the bobbin. And I have such a tiny amount left that what I'm going to do is just do a bunch of treadling until I get my ply, and then I'm just going to walk the yarn on. And by walking the yarn on, um, I don't have to make you know, a, a three yard skein <laughs> at the end. I'll position this over here so that you can see what I'm talking about. And down we go. Oops. Oh, not that one. I need this one. Oh. So I'm just treadling until I get the amount of ply that I want. And you can see just like how full it is here. There's no like visible gap between the, the yarn on the bobbin and the uh, flyer. So I'm just using my thumb to gently pull that on and I'm going to move it a hook. So Whereas I generally don't recommend doing this for um, the duration because you are slightly abrading the yarn as you do this. Actually, it's a little bit better on my finger. So I'm just walking on the yarn because I don't have much to go and this isn't going to make a huge impact in these last couple of yards. But one of the other reasons why I don't recommend doing this is it has a tendency to pull the twist out of your yarn. So always try to over ply ever so slightly to compensate for that. So I'm almost done. And you can probably see in this uh, close up how nice that yarn looks now. So there's still a lot of visible texture because I've got that ply that uh, coordinates, it harmonizes really well. It's not uh, garish and distracting. It just, it's a bunch of warm tones that you would associate with the holidays uh, or the autumn this time of year. And it just looks like an, uh, a planned yarn rather than something that was a bit of an accident um, that uh, I'm sort of compensating for with this uh, second yarn. And there we've got it. We are pretty much at the end now. And I've got a lot of that original bat that I over blended left over. So yeah. I'll give you a little bit of a close-up here. So yeah, there's a lot of texture, a lot of color. You've got all those lovely warm tones in there. I think it'll make a really great project. Turn that up just a touch. Yeah. It looks like if you took a bunch of colorful leaves that had fallen from trees and kind of crumpled it up into confetti. That's what this yarn reminds me of. So yeah, quite pleased with that.
Okay, so that is done. And I have a pretty sizable amount left over. Now, what I could do, I'd say I probably use about half. I didn't weigh it, so I don't know. Uh, and that's okay. You don't always have to measure everything, <laughs> said the scientist. Um, but because I've used it in this yarn here, one of the things that I could do is I could ply this on itself, or I could even do a Navajo ply to make it a little bit thicker, more in line with the yarn that I've made here. And I could then use these two yarns in the same project. So if I wanted to weave something like um, a, a basic scarf, or if I um, wanted to knit something that had some color work with it, um, you know, I might be able to get this uh, similar gauge. It would be a two ply versus a three ply, which could be really interesting. Um, I could use it for um, anything that has sort of like cuffs. So if I wanted to make the body of some fingerless mitts with a thicker yarn and then use this for the uh, cuff and also the ribbing that usually goes on the end uh, by the fingers. Because then if this is thinner, then um, I can use a smaller needle and um, it will sort of naturally want to uh, tighten on that part of my arm. Uh, so that's a possibility. Um, yeah, so, and I could also leave it as is and, and use it for another bat. Like I could do something similar to this and then um, I could have more similar yarn that could be used in another project. So there's there's still a lot of choices for what I can do with this yarn. So, um, you know, I can kind of, if you want to think about it this way, you could also build a project based on something that was sort of like maybe an accident. You know, you didn't think that um, blending it four times would turn out this way. And then you're like, well, the spin didn't really seem to improve it too much, in my humble opinion. Uh, and so, uh, whereas you might have gone into this uh, entire situation with a plan that has then completely changed because uh, you were not happy with the result, could actually create an entirely new project where you embrace what you've made. And I think that's one of those wonderful qualities of wool and fiber arts in general is there's no real wrong, it's just a difference in perspective. So whereas um, I wasn't a huge fan of this when I started, I'm actually really liking the idea of plying this up and putting this together as a project in and of itself to kind of show off how you could take something that might have been an accident or maybe it was like maybe, maybe it was like you trying to figure out how to achieve a specific look and you know you've learned how not to do it for, for that uh, particular look or style or aesthetic um, so you know that's great, and um, I hope that you liked watching this project over the last uh, two live streams. Um, I will probably hold off putting in this this into the the shop until I have fully decided what I'm going to do with it because I initially thought that I was just going to, I was just going to put this into the shop and sell it as yarn, um, but I don't know I I might I might think about doing something else with it. We'll see. Now, as promised, I was going to show you some of the bats. So, it's not red and green, it's pink and lime green. <laughs> and I've called it gumdrop. And one of the things that I like about it is you get like this high contrast look and it's really fluffy and it just reminds me of candy, like sugared candy at this time of year. And then I've got these two. Which I don't know what I'm going to call this one. But it kind of reminds me of those antique baubles that you see at, um, you know, charity shops and the like. 
I did see some actually at a charity shop in Leicester that I never bought and I kind of wish I did because it would be fun to have some vintage British um, ornaments and things. So yeah, that's kind of what that one reminds me of. Oh, oh. <laughs> and then this one, which doesn't really look too Christmassy, I have to admit. But if I were to describe to you a cold, clear Christmas Eve where the stars are shining, you'd kind of get the sense that this is sort of like a dreamscape you might have where it's cold, it's dark, you've got, you know, clouds maybe every once in a while, some shimmer from stars, you've got a little bit of red and green in there, and I've actually used tinsel that I bought ages ago. So, <laughs> I don't know if you, if the camera will really pick up on it, but it's that little bit right there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, kind of an interesting take on Christmas. So um, if these are uh, of interest to you, they will be in the shop. Uh, and if I happen to sell out before this video comes out, I will try to make some more because if they're that popular, then hey, I'll make more. <laughs> um, so yeah, there we have it. Um, some bats that I've been working on. Um, this yarn is now done. I've got a whole host of videos lined up because I really don't have much else to do while I'm recovering. Um, and I'm going a little bit stir crazy. So it's been just over a week. <laughs> so I broke my foot on the 30th of October and it is now the 9th of November. And uh, a few days ago, I had the worst back pain, basically because <laughs> I've been confined to a seated position because even if I'm up doing things every once in a while, like I, I can do dishes, I can cook, uh, some things I can't do, like if I have to brace a piece of food to cut it like bread, I can't do that with this hand, it hurts too much. Um, then I still have to remember that I'm recovering. So I'll have an hour where I'm sitting with my leg propped up. So I've been watching all kinds of movies on Amazon. If you, if you are familiar with the Hallmark-esque um, Amazon Christmas movies, <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, yeah, I am trying to make progress with getting some things uh, set up uh, for you guys. Uh, so there's plenty of things to watch over the holiday season, uh, plenty of things to look at in the shop. And for those of you who uh, want to support me, uh, I first of all, really appreciate it because not being able to work my job has been extremely stressful. Um, I would prefer it if you shopped through actualladie.com rather than Etsy, if you could, mainly because those funds go directly to me and I get more of my profits if you purchase from my website than you do if you purchase through Etsy. But then again, the reason why I've kept both shops open is specifically for the people who might not know about my website, but also have reasons to purchase through Etsy rather than my website. So um, that's there. Um, I'm going to be hopefully able enough to start uh, dyeing some more. So maybe I'll have some new colors, uh, possibly in December. I'm hoping in December. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take for my foot recovery. Some days are better than others. Uh, thankfully, the swelling is mostly down. Um, and then uh, I can do more physical therapy to kind of get it back into working order. And then, uh, yeah, some, I have some ideas. Hopefully I'll be able to get to them. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting the prep ready and forcing myself to put on makeup and sit here. <laughs> But it's coming. Um, 
I'll probably do at least two more full live streams um, before uh, we get our internet upgraded. But if you're watching this with me, uh, thank you so much for watching. And um, yeah, I don't have any ideas for the next full live stream. So if you have anything kicking around in there, please send that my way. Uh, as always, thank you so much for watching. If you uh, like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe because I know there's a whole host of you who watch and don't subscribe. But the more people who subscribe, it tells YouTube that this is a great thing to watch. This is an awesome channel. And because we're such a relatively small community, it would be nice to get the word out through a big company like YouTube. Well, Google. <laughs> okay, thank you again.